I greet all of you in the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. The title for our meditation this morning is The Full Christian Experience. The text for our meditation is taken from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Let us turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Let us read this passage responsively. I will begin and please respond. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Thank God for the reading of his most holy and sacred word. Let us pray. Almighty God, Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the gathering of Your children in which they can come together to listen to Your Word. O Lord, we pray that You will bless our meeting and may the Holy Spirit teach us and be our teacher and guide. And may You forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray all these things with thanksgiving In Jesus' name, Amen. What is Christianity to you? What does being a Christian mean to you? To a lot of Christians, it is merely salvation from eternal damnation in hell. To escape hell fire. It is a matter of getting out of hell and getting into heaven. There is absolutely nothing wrong with having this mindset. This is because the warning of hell is plenty in the Bible. We are warned that hell is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is a place of great torture and torment. We are to flee from the wrath that is to come. Escape from hell can be one of the factors that caused us to believe in the first place. God purposely puts the reality of hell in the Bible to serve as a warning to all those who don't believe. However, many Christians never move past this stage in their Christian journey. Just stay there. And there is all there is to them in Christianity. For this group of Christians, Christianity becomes fulfilling certain obligations, such as obeying God's commandments, coming to church on Sunday, and you give 10% of what you earn. After the worship service is over, you will say to yourself, I have fulfilled my obligations to be in heaven. And right now, I have to rush home. There is no more business for you in the church. The next time you are found in the church is next week, next Sunday. There is no growth to your Christian experience. 
This is all there is in Christianity for you. There is nothing more to it. This is actually Christianity in its infancy. Christianity becomes bland, tasteless, unexciting, and dull to this group of Christians. And for some others, you might have progressed from that stage. And what Christianity means to you is that you will abound for your service for the Lord. You may serve in certain committees in the church. You have your various duties. You do your duties to the best of your abilities. For example, you are in the usher ministry. You make sure that the newcomers are welcome. People get their seats. And if you are in the refreshment ministry, you make sure everyone gets their food and drink. You are in the AV ministry, you make sure that the sound system is working well. And if you are in a choir, you practice hard, and then you sing well for the Lord during some occasions. And for others, the Christian experience is to taste the brotherly or sisterly fellowship in the church. There is this unexplainable warmth or care that you have for each other. You are willing to go the extra mile for your Christian brother or sister in Christ. You love coming to fellowship. And for some others, the Christian experience is an academic pursuit. You thirst to know more and more about the Word of God, to know theology, doctrines, the teachings of the Bible. And from there, you form your own positions and convictions regarding certain doctrines of the Bible. I want to say at this point in time that there is nothing wrong with what I've said so far. If your Christian experience as such, it is perfectly fine. We fear hell, yes. We serve God joyfully, yes. We love Christian fellowship. We love to know more and more about the Bible. But is there anything more to our Christian experience in this life? Are we missing out on something? Is your Christian experience full? If what I have mentioned is all there is to Christianity, we are not getting the most of what our Christian experience is meant to be. From the passage of our meditation this morning, we have a passage that describes the epitome of our Christian experience. This is the height or the climax of our Christian experience. There are great possibilities for you and I to experience in our Christian journey in this earth. To give us an overview of this experience, let me point out to you the description of the experience from verses 17 to 19. There are three things that are being stated here. Number one, from verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Secondly, you may come to comprehend God's love in His breadth and length, depth and height. And that is from verse 18. Number three, you will be filled with all the fullness of God. And that is found from verse 19. Before we experience what is stated from verses 17 to 19, we must be prepared for it beforehand. We can go through many experiences in this life without being prepared. You can go to school without being prepared. You can go to your workplace without being prepared. But this full Christian experience cannot be received by any one of us without being adequately prepared for it. No one can receive this experience frivolously. You must be ready to receive such an experience. Some groundwork 
must be done first before anyone is to receive this experience. Therefore, Apostle Paul states the prerequisite for the experience from verses 14 to 16. Verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now you may ask, why do we need strengthening? Why? We need strengthening because the fullness of the experience is too much for us to bear. It is so great, so much beyond us that if you were to experience it without the help of God, it will be disastrous. If you receive this unprepared, you will be crushed by the weight of it. The Bible records some of the encounters that people had with God that crushed them. Or certain experiences that people um, can that it records certain experiences that people cannot receive from God. For example, during the encounter of Moses with God at Mount Sinai. During that incident of the golden calf, God told Moses, I will not go with you. I will send an angel with you. But Moses beseeched the Lord, go with us. If you go not with us, do not send us there. And Moses told God, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. That is to give an affirmation to Moses. I am still with you. Moses yearned for the glory of God to be seen. But God told him, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. You cannot see my face and live, for no man can see me and live. And even Apostle John, when he was on the island of Patmos, Christ appeared to him. And it was said that when John saw him, he fell at his feet as dead. Not only that the fullness of that experience is too much for us to bear, our spiritual maturity also plays a part as to how much we can receive from God. The Bible describes some of us as babes in the faith. We are new in the faith. We can only be given milk. But some of us uh, can be given meat when we have progressed from our Christian infancy. Let us now look at the prerequisite for the full Christian experience from verses 14 to 16. Verse 14. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can see that this is a prayer. For this cause. For what cause? Now we must know the background and the context for this prayer. In Ephesians chapter 1, Apostle Paul tells the Christians at Ephesus the plan of salvation, that God the Father has elected them before the foundation of the world, the Son has redeemed them through His blood, and they are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The work of the Trinity is stated in Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 2, Apostle Paul tells them of the hindrances that they faced from becoming a Christian. Chapter 2, verse 1. They were dead in trespasses and sins. Their sins stood in their way. And in verse 11 of chapter 2. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. The second hindrance that they faced was that they were Gentiles. There is a great divide between the Jews and the Gentiles. Gentiles were outside the covenantal promise of God. It was only given to Israel, to the Jews. But at the end of Ephesians chapter 2, Apostle Paul tells them that the work of Christ has abolished all the hindrances 
that Gentiles like you and me face in becoming the children of God. There's no more hindrances that we face from becoming the children of God. From Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 onwards, Apostle Paul returns to what he originally intended to say at the end of chapter 2. At the end of chapter 2, he tells them that Gentiles like us have been brought into a com complete state of unity with the Jews in the church. There's no more there's no more a great divide between the Jews and the Gentiles. We are all brought together, united by the blood of Christ. Let me read for you, chapter 2, verse 19 onwards. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temper in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Apostle Paul seems to take a digression from chapter 3 verse 1 onwards. He talks about himself. But from verse 14 of chapter 3, he returns to them and talks about them. Why is there such a digression from chapter 3, verse 1 onwards, where he talks about himself, talks about his calling, talks about him being a prisoner? This is because he wants to tell them why godly people suffer. In case they were to wonder, well, Apostle Paul, you talk about all these great things about us from chapter 1 and 2, you are a prisoner. So he wants to tell them from chapter 3, verses 1 to 13, why do godly people suffer? It is all because of the purpose of God. He's a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. He is put there in the prison by the Lord Jesus. None other. It's not the Romans, but Jesus Christ. He wants to tell them, he wants to convince them that God is in full control of all things. Don't doubt what I'm going to tell you. So he returns to tell them this great truth about them from verses 14 onwards. We can see that Apostle Paul is in a kneeling position as he prays for the Christians at Ephesus. You see, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a prayer that is uttered even when Paul is in great difficulties himself. This, during the time of the writing of this epistle, Apostle Paul is in prison. He is in great difficulty himself. He doesn't put his release from the prison of Rome has the foremost in his mind. But he wants the Christians at Ephesus to experience this full Christian experience that they were supposed to have. It consumes him so much that he has to pray for them rather than praying for his release or circumstances, but he prays for their experience. This is most certainly an urgent matter. Even though he may be in prison, he still prays for them to have this experience. This is not something that you and I can put off. If you discover that you do not have the full experience of a Christian, you must yearn after it. You must go after it with zeal, with your whole heart. I want to have this full Christian experience. You must not delay, but like Apostle Paul, you pray that God will strengthen you spiritually and grant you the experience that is meant for you. You may say Apostle Paul has talked about the truth from chapter 1 and 2, 
God has given them all spiritual blessings. Look at chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All that they need to flourish in this Christian life on earth is given to them. There is no lack. You need forgiveness, God gives it to you. You need to flourish in the area of your ministry, God gives it to you. You need to be filled with the Spirit of God, God gives it to you. God gives you everything. But you may ask, if God has given to me everything, why is there a need for prayer? This is because there is a difference between knowing what is true for you and to truly experience it. You may read about driving, you may read about swimming, but you have not really driven a car. You have not really swam. You have not really done all that. You know that those things are true for you, but you have not experienced it. You must not delay. You must not let all that you know stop you from coming to this experience. Don't think that I have known a lot already. There is no more to Christianity. No, there is far more than we can ever know. Take note of the way in which how Apostle Paul addresses God the Father in verse 15. How does Apostle Paul address the Heavenly Father here? Chapter 3 verse 15 says, Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. There are many ways in which Paul can use to address the Father. But why in this particular way, this special way? The one to whom he comes to is the Father, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The idea of a family is stated here. It is where everyone in the family gets his or her surname after the Father. Different families have different surnames. There are divisions between different families. But Apostle Paul is telling them, we are all in this one big family. God is the Father of all. He is the Father of everyone in heaven and earth. Every Christian bears the name of God. But why? What is the purpose of telling them that every Christian bears the name of God? Paul is actually telling them, do not think of yourself as Gentiles outside the covenantal promise of God anymore. Remember he talked about the hindrance that they face in becoming the children of God, that they were Gentiles far away, but they are made nigh by the blood of Christ. He wants to assure them one last time before he goes into the detail of his prayer that you are truly a child of God. You need to be fully assured that you are a child of God before you can truly experience what is to come. That is the purpose in which why Apostle Paul addresses the Father in that way in verse 15. Verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. God must help you by his spirit. He would grant you the prerequisite to have the full Christian experience is that you must ask God for it. After you see that you have not experienced the Christian experience fully, you must be urgent to have it. You know that you are missing out. Yes, that's fine. But don't stop at that. You pray. The next step is to pray for it. What is the measure by which God can strengthen you? How much must be done 
in order to strengthen you to receive this full Christian experience? Verse 16 says, It must be according to the riches of His glory. The measure of how much God can strengthen you is according to the riches of His glory. How do you measure God's glory? Can we put a number to this glorious God? Can we weigh it? No, we cannot. But hypothetically speaking, if you can put a number to the riches of His glory, that is the measure by which God can strengthen you. The glorious God, without limit, without bounds, infinite, eternal and unchangeable, can strengthen you according to His glory. The glory of God is the full summation of all the attributes of God. It is full. In other words, God is more than able to strengthen us with might. We ask Him because He is more than able to strengthen us according to the measure of His great glory. The fact that we need to be strengthened by the riches of His glory shows our weaknesses in receiving what God is prepared to give us. It takes so much to strengthen us spiritually in order to make us to be prepared, make us ready to receive what is to come. What is this experience, you may ask right now? Let us look at the description of this experience from verses 17 to 19. Are you ready for this? Verse 17 says, That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, is Apostle Paul addressing Christians here? At first glance, it seems like Paul is saying that the Ephesian Christians must have Christ dwelling in them. We have read from our responsive reading just now, from Romans 8 verse 9. It says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. When you are truly born again, the Spirit of Christ is in you. You have the Spirit of Christ. Let me read to you from 2 Corinthians 13.5. It says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Apostle Paul is telling the Christians at Corinth, you are a reprobate if Christ is not in you. So all that we have said tells us that when we are Christians, Christ is in you is in us. We have the Spirit of Christ. Each one of you who claims to be a Christian has the Spirit of Christ in you. But what is verse 17 of chapter 3 from Ephesians telling us then? That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. To help us to understand this, we need to look at an account in which Jesus, by the hand of Apostle John, wrote to the Christians at Laodicea in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. Let us turn to Revelation chapter 3.
versus 14 onwards. Laodicea church has a relationship with God, but it was a lukewarm relationship. They were not controlled by the Spirit of Christ. They were children of God, yes. But they had certain influence from the world, and they gave in to it. They gave in to materialism, and they obey God as and when they like. And to God, it's a lukewarm relationship. And God wants, Christ wants them. I will spill you out of my mouth if you don't repent. And look at verse 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Christ is telling them, you need to let me come into your life. You need to let me have this intimacy with you. It's not merely just obeying me as and when you like, and you'll be controlled by materialism, but you must have this intimacy with the Lord. Christ dwelling in us means to have this intimacy with the Lord, to be controlled by Him. And this must be done by faith. Let us go back to the text of our, of our meditation from Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. You must know that this is possible for you. You must not say that, wow, this is only for the super Christians or Christians who are more mature. But you must believe and you must go to God with boldness and confidence and with assurance that He would strengthen you with might to have this intimacy with Him, that He will grant you. Oftentimes, we overemphasize the fact that God will do everything. But let us not forget that we have our responsibilities to fulfill too. You want to have this intimacy with the Lord? You must pray. You must go to Him, yearn after it. You must work out your salvation with fear and trembling. To have this intimacy with the Lord means you have no more self-will, but all of God. You must go to Him by faith. You must not doubt. God has promised, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. And he also promised us, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You want that? God will grant it to you. The result of Christ dwelling in us, having this intimate relationship with us, is that we will be rooted and grounded in love. In verse 17, that ye... This is the result of having this intimate relationship with Christ. That ye, being rooted and grounded in love. There are two pictures that Apostle Paul is using here to teach us something. From the word rooted, it gives us a picture of a very tall tree with thick trunk firmly planted in the earth. It is not just some slender plant and when the wind comes, the plant will be uprooted. No, but this is a big, huge tree with a very thick trunk firmly planted in the soil. And if you were to uproot this tree, the soil will be taken up too, together with the roots. This is the idea here of this word, rooted. The other word that Apostle Paul uses here is the word grounded. It gives us a picture of a very tall building, but it has a very strong foundation. The central idea of these two pictures that Apostle Paul gives to us here is that of 
permanence. It is a steadfast kind of love. The love that is steadfast, continuous, will not be swayed by anything. Love is the soil in which our Christian life is set and in which it grows. The love of God must control your every thought and action. There is no value in our obedience to Christ if it is not motivated by our love for Him. So our Christian experience is not merely coming here to listen to the Word of God, not merely obeying certain sets of rules and regulations in the Bible. That's not it. But the foundation must be there, the love of God. You may ask, why are there two pictures that are being used here? Is not one enough? Why the picture of the plant, of the tree? And next, he uses the picture of a building. He uses the picture of a building to tell us, for buildings to go tall, the foundation must be firm. The master builder will not rush into building the house, but he will spend a lot of time, he will pay a lot of attention to build the foundation, make it right. Right now at my home, as I look out of the window, I can see construction work going on. I can see that the builder or the construction workers are piling up huge stones, one on top of another, waiting for it to go into the ground. Spend a lot of time building the foundation, making it ready. A master builder will not want the house quickly. He will take time to prepare the foundation. This is making way or preparing the way for what is greater to come. What is the greater thing that will come? The text in verse 18 says, the breadth, the length, the depth and height of his love. This is what is to come. And your foundation must be right, must be strong and firm first. Many of us want to do great things without paying attention to this foundation. We want to go for missions. We want to serve in this area and that area. We want results. We want all sorts of things. But have not really paid attention to this foundation, which is the love for God. This foundation is the love for God. All your relationships in the church must be based upon this love, this love for God. Your Christian experience is not merely coming together to have this warm, fuzzy feeling for each other. It's not merely brotherly and sisterly love that you have for each other. And if you have that, nothing wrong. But if it's not built upon this love for God, it will crumble. It will not last long. Your service for God, if it is not founded upon the love of God, it will be crushed. It will be gone. You will not be serving God anymore. Don't look at your service for God. Look at your love for God. Is your foundation right? Your obedience to the commandments must be based on your love for Him too. No point in obeying the commandments of God without loving Him. Your foundation must be right. And when your foundation is right, you are prepared to go higher. And what is this higher experience that you and I can have? It's found from verse 18. May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. The previous petitions of Paul lead up to this objective. One of the highest attainments in the Christian life is to know the love of Christ to us, to comprehend it, to lay hold of it, his love to us, 
the length, the, the breadth, the, the height, the depth of it. At this moment, you may be perplexed because this seems to present some difficulties at first. Some of you may ask, well, when I became a Christian at first, I realized that God loves me. Before I believed, I already knew that God loves me. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Well, you, you don't mean that I don't know this love. I know this love. John 3, 16, I know John 3, 16. But what is Apostle Paul talking about here from verse 18? What is he talking about here? The experience of God's love is much greater than mere awareness. You may know it at the beginning, but you have not realized it. This is not a concept, but it is a personal knowledge of His love for you. There is a vast difference between knowing about the love of God versus knowing the love itself. Well, you know about, you know about it, yes, but do you know it? Do, have you experienced it? The end of all our learning of doctrines is to lead us to this experience that God loves us. Look at the dimensions that are being stated here. The, le the breadth, the length, the depth and height. All these suggest vastness. The breadth of it, the great expanse of His love. He came to you. He chose you. He elected you before you were even born, before the foundation of the world, when you were His enemy. He came to die for you. The vast expanse of His love. And the length of it, it lasts forever. It will not end. His love for you lasts forever. The depth of it, what He did for you. He has not held back anything. But He gave His life for you, even His very life. He would do anything for you, including giving up His life for you in order to save you. That's the depth of His love. And the height of His love, He has lifted up from our misery. If you look at Ephesians 2, we were sinners most miserable. Ephesians 2, verse 2, wherein in time past, He walked according to the counsel of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the last of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us. You were in misery, but He has lifted up from that slump taken you to great heights, adopted you to be a child of God, to be the children of God, to be His very own, to be heirs and joint heirs with, with Christ. His love for you is immeasurable and it is eternal. That is why we need to be strengthened before we can know the love of Christ. I came across an account of a Welsh preacher. His name was Evans Roberts. Once he attended an evangelistic preaching, he heard the gospel during that preaching. And he was so overwhelmed that he knelt down. There was perspiration, presp and people thought that he was sick. Let me read to you what he wrote. I felt a living power pervading my bosom. It took my breath away and my legs trembled exceedingly. This living power became stronger and stronger as, as each one prayed until I felt it would tear me apart. 
My whole bosom was a turmoil, and if I had not prayed, it would have burst. I fell on my knees with my arms over the seat in front of me. My face was bathed in perspiration, and the tears flowed in streams. It was God's commanding love which bent me. What a wave of peace flooded my bosom. I was filled with compassion for those who must bend at the judgment, and I wept. Following that, the salvation of human soul was solemnly impressed on me. I felt ablaze with the desire to go through the length and breadth of Wales to tell of the Saviour. He was so overwhelmed by the love of God that he knelt down and cried. This experience must be the experience of every one of us here. This is not just for some buddy, some preacher, or elders and deacons, or pastor, but this is for every one of you. During our singing just now, we sang the lily of the valley. The writer of that hymn wrote, I have found a friend in Jesus. He is everything to me. When you sang this song just now, does it resonate in your heart? Is it true of you? Or you just go through the motion and sing that song? Is he everything to you? And other hymns like, Oh love, that will not let me go. These are reflections of the inner feeling, innermost feelings of the hymn writers. And they reflect it in their hymns. And the psalmists have written so much about this personal relationship with the Lord. Like David, let me read to you like what, uh, what David wrote. O oh Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. These are the heart cry of David. Is this true for you? This is true for you. This is true for you because Apostle Paul is writing to ordinary Christians at Ephesus like you and me. He is not writing to pastors or elders or deacons, but he is writing to the Christians at Ephesus. He calls them saints. And here, chapter 3, verse 18, it says, May be able to comprehend with all saints, with all saints, it means this is a promise that is possible for all of us. The phrase with all saints is added there to tell us that this is possible for you. For you. It's possible. You need to take it by faith. And what is more? In verse 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. How to know something which passeth knowledge? Well, if it passes knowledge, how can I know it? You go chasing after it, but you cannot seem to know it. The meaning is, even though we may not be able to experience the love of Christ fully, because it is so vast, it is so great, so beyond us. It is still our duty to learn as much as we can about it. We are to go chasing after it, even though we may not comprehend it fully. It is for us. The purpose of experience this, experiencing this is that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Verse 19, and to know the love of Christ, 
which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now you may say, if the fullness of God were to come into me, I will die immediately. Yes, you are right. Because God is so infinite, so vast, so majestic. But what the Apostle Paul is talking about here is his commun communicable attributes. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. These are the in incommunicable attributes. You cannot have them. Because you and I are mere humans. But the definition of God continues to say, in His being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness and truth. In other words, to be filled with the fullness of God means that you'll be more and more like Him. You'll be more and more like God after tasting the love of God. If you are under the weight of His love, that you know that He loves you so much, how can you not yearn to be like Him? How can you go the way that you want to without fully surrendering yourself to Him, without becoming more and more like Him? Christianity is not a mere observance of some rules and regulations like what I've told you. But what steals you to obey Him is after experiencing His great love for you. And after hearing all this, what must be your reaction to this experience? The, ex the reaction to this experience that you and I should have is found from verses 20 to 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. This is a doxology. What should come out of you after hearing all this is to praise Him. That you will burst out with praise to God. You can't help it. Apostle Paul couldn't help it. He just burst out in prayer, sorry, in praise to God. And you and I must do that. Beside praising God, are you still unconvinced that this is for you? To know the love of God in the breadth, the length, the depth and the height of it, is this too much for you? No. Apostle Paul, on top of praising God, he wants to encourage us one more time. If you had not experienced it, you pray for it. Because here, the description of God is, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. The hindrance in ask, asking is to doubt the power of God. But God is described here to be able to do exceeding abundantly. There is a saying, with no ceiling, there is no limit. But oftentimes, we like to limit God. We want to put a limit to what God can do for me. But here, Apostle Paul is telling you, bring your most daring petitions to God. There is no danger in acceding to what He can do. Whatever things you ask, He can do for you. Apostle Paul wants to tell us two further proofs that God is able to do this. It says here that God can strengthen you according to the power that worketh in us. This is the present power that is in all of you right now. This is the power that caused you to believe in the first place and has kept you going to be all that God wants you to be, to be a child of God. This is working in you right now. It's energetic. It's flowing through you right now. You cannot be a Christian without this power working in you. How great is this power? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. 
Let us look at the greatness of this power. Apostle Paul prays for them from verse 18 onwards. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And now pay attention to verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word, who believe according to the working of his mighty power? This is the power that caused you to believe in the first place. It's in you. And with the same power, he can continue to work in you to experience the love of Christ. What is the magnitude of this power? In verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him up from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The measure of this power is the measure of the power which raised up Christ. Whatever power that was needed to raise up Christ was the power that, that is working in you. It is working in you right now. How much power does it take to raise up someone from the dead? Great amount of power. And that power is working in you right now. You have to know that it exists within you. And furthermore, in the text of our meditation, the other proof that Apostle Paul wants to tell them is to show them the church. Verse 21, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. The church is another manifestation of his great power, the great power that is working in all of us here. For a church to exist, it is a miracle. Do not take it lightly. For us here to come together, it is a manifestation of the power of God. The full Christian experience has no end. It is like climbing a mountain. You will go higher and higher, but you will not reach the top. You may face hindrances along the way. You may be disheartened. Satan may pull you down. But you must continue to go higher and higher to experience the love of God. But before you go higher, you must make sure that your foundation is right. You must make sure that you are rooted and grounded in love. You love the Lord steadfastly. And you must be prepared to reach new heights. And to know God, to know the love of God with a love that passes knowledge. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, help us not to be contented with what we merely know about Thee, what we merely understand from the messages, but may we truly experience it. We pray for each Christian here that they would experience the love of Christ. But Lord, you must strengthen us first in the inner man or else it is too much for us to take. May you have mercy on us. May we reach new heights in our Christian experience and may we know more and more about your love which passeth knowledge. All these things we pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.